Okay, everyone, hello, and welcome to our second Learning Lab session of a &H Academy Week 2022. My name is Elena Martinez, and I'll be the session manager for this session titled Calculating the Cost and Affordability of a Healthy Diet. Thank you so much for taking part in a &H 22, and we look forward to a robust and interactive session today. Just want to give a quick reminder that you can find conference materials and the program on our conference website that I'm putting in the chat right now. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Professor William Masters, who will get us started. Hello, everybody. Yes, thank you so much for joining. Um, for most of you, I think almost all of you actually, this is the first of the ANH Academy used to be week, now two weeks of events uh, that you've joined. Um, and I want to say just a couple of words about that. So this is the seventh annual ANH Academy week, or now two week. And the first annual one, the second, third, fourth, we went back and forth in person. They were wonderful events. And now ANH Academy is growing up with the seventh annual. Uh, I looked into kind of child development. What happens when a child turns seven? I have two daughters and when they turn seven, they became themselves. They gained independence. Um, they started learning just a lot about the world. And I think we've grown up in a lot that way, uh, gaining independence, uh, becoming very unique. a &H Academy is the only organization of its type in the world. And some of the milestones that happen at age seven for a person, and I think maybe for a &H Academy too, one thing is a child learns to count, learns numbers and learns to use numbers in interesting ways. I remember when my kids were seven kind of playing number games and thinking, you know, if a cat has six kittens and then each of the six has six kittens, how many grandchildren does the cat have? And we're doing a lot of really interesting quantitative things. A child at seven also learns a lot of language and we're doing so many great qualitative things. So for example, a child at age seven, and I think a &H Academy too, we learn that the same word has different meanings. And that helps people learn to communicate with nuance, with subtlety. Um, and when a child learns that the same word has different meanings, they can do jokes. Um, children age seven start to be funny. I think we have a good culture uh, in, in the AH Academy uh, and to pay attention to each other and to have that community, that sense of uh, who, is, who, who we are and knowing each other because we see each other again and again. So some people on this call, we've been together, we've had meetings, I recognize people's names. Um, and remember from meeting to meeting, even if we've only been online in these last three years. So I feel like we have a very strong community. I hope you feel that too. And this is just the first of the whole session. Our learning labs, of course, are followed by the full week of conference activity. Um, some big favorites of mine for that, the 60 second uh, poster presentations. I love that. Um, I love the traditional research. Uh, but I especially find that our a &H Academy's learning labs are a really special thing. So I'm really grateful to, to Anna Herforth, who will lead most of this session, um, to Elena, who's organized it so well, along with um, Julia Madison from Tufts, who did much of the logistics for the learning labs, uh, all of the learning labs for registration and so forth, um, and then the entire Emana project team that's been managing uh, events and the folks in South Africa who are meeting in person, um, as well as all of you joining online. So we'll hear a lot also from Rachel Gilbert today, um, a researcher on the project, working closely with collaborators in a number of countries, uh, and Christina Sukurenko, who um, has been working across a number of different areas, as you see from this slide, on the Global Diet Quality Project, uh, as well as this Food Prices for Nutrition Project. So I have the privilege of leading this Food Prices for Nutrition project that created the methods that we'll be learning today. Um, and I thought we'd just start with a little icebreaker. <laughs> um, so to make sure you're all good at typing in your chat box, uh, that you get the experience of thinking about this conversation, this learning lab as an experience to reflect on your own um, work uh, and your own situation, um, in terms of the cost and affordability of a healthy diet and the difficulty of collecting good data on item prices, if you can just open the chat box or just click on chat at the bottom of your screen 
And in the chat box, just type the price and the thing that you remember the cost of that you most recently bought, the food or beverage item that you might remember was your most recent food purchase. So this is just recalling the, the price of a food. Okay, so the challenge is gonna be to think about the food item you remember and remember its price, which is hard enough, but also think about like, what units do we need to measure this in? Like, did I pay, you know, so the most recent thing I did um, is it was my older daughter's birthday. We went and we got, uh, went to a, a place and had pizza, okay? So I know it was $14 for the pizza. So you could type $14 for a pizza. But it's a big question, like how big a pizza? What was on the pizza? What is the food composition of the pizza? So let's just look at this list of things that's gonna scroll by and think about items that are purchased each of which has a price and this really subtle problem of understanding food composition, food group identity, the nutritional qualities of these different foods uh, is super interesting. Whoa, there's another pizza. Thank you and Kiru. So a lot of uh, whole foods, milk, eggs, uh, one prepared dish, rice with grilled fish in an omelet, um, some processed packaged foods like curd, Presumably that's uh, soybean curd in Indonesia, I think. All right, Indian rupees, sorry. Um, oh, interesting. Somebody had a, a subtle product, cassava couscous. Not a very common product, uh, but a very interesting one that might not be present in some food composition tables, some lists. Interesting problems of units. One crate of eggs. <laughs> How many eggs are in a crate of eggs? And are they big eggs, small eggs? Uh, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to see items that are whose composition is very hard to tell include coconuts because the composition of a coconut depends a lot on how much moisture is still in it. As a coconut dries, it loses moisture, so it gets lighter. And, but the calories in it are the same. So calories per kg of coconut depend enormously on its water weight. Um, and what we'll see is that water weight and, and, and getting around the problem of water weight in food is a big, big challenge for us. Fantastic, thank you, thank you everyone. And then there's one other uh, warm up we want to do, which is please to, um, to try to memorialize this group, this community, um, and just remember uh, have, a, have a chance to have a photograph of all of us. So if you don't mind taking yourselves off video, uh, Christina will just take some photos so that we have the full group. And we really appreciate that as a sense of, of community and being, um, we're not in the same room, uh, but we are in the same place. We're in the same place mentally and in our agenda, our work, our, our goals. I think our mission is very similar. So really appreciate you um, being here and taking yourselves off, uh, you know, on the video so we can have the photo. Thank you. So great to see you all. We have a couple really nice photos from this. Usually uh, people try to do this at the end of a session. People are on their way out. So it's nice to, yeah. nice to capture it all now. Thank you, everyone. Good. So Anna, if you can walk people through the magic you've accomplished of how we measure cost and affordability of a healthy diet. Thank you, Will, and um, the whole Food Prices for Nutrition team and, um, and everyone who's here today in this global community. Um, it's, yeah, it's really wonderful to, to be able to gather in this way. And um, I will give an intro introduction of the topic for the Learning Lab today, which is really a team effort. Um, you know, I listed several of the the people here on the first slide uh, who have you know directly designed today's session, um, but the whole team, including Alina, who's here, and uh, the the rest of the food prices for nutrition team has contributed to this whole agenda. So when we're talking about the cost and affordability of healthy diets globally, and today we will be um, practicing how to calculate that, we are really talking about indicators to understand food access. And um, it's been 
really a wonderful collaboration that has developed with FAO in using these, these metrics in the uh, UN State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World reports um, for the last two years and will be coming soon uh, in, a, in just a couple of weeks, um, looking again towards the 2022 report. And using the indicators of cost and affordability of a healthy diet to join other food security metrics that have been uh, published for quite some time, including especially the prevalence of undernourishment, which tracks access to adequate calories. And uh, then more recently, the food insecurity experience scale. And we add this dimension of access to a healthy diet because it is, um, it's a critical piece of the vision that we as a global community have held for the last 25 years on food security um, being when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to meet dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So um, what, we're, what we're essentially doing with this indicator is highlighting that piece here that's highlighted or bolded on access to nutritious food to meet dietary needs and really pointing out where that's not accessible to people and what parts of the diet are not accessible, which can inform what this community does on agriculture, nutrition, and health. How can food systems in agriculture transform or be um, improved to help make sure that everyone can access uh, each piece of a nutritious diet to meet dietary needs? To do this, we use food-based dietary guidelines. That's that first acronym there, FBDG, Food-Based Dietary Guidelines, as a standard, which is, um, it's an appropriate standard of economic access to sufficient nutritious food because dietary guidelines are created as a realistic way for regular people to be able to select, first of all, nutrient adequate diets so that people have you know, guidance on what a balanced diet looks like that would provide nutrient adequacy and also that would protect health against um, non-communicable diseases. So for the long-term, um, having a, a healthy diet that um, provides both you know, short-term nutrient adequacy and long-term protection of health. And very importantly, diets that are dignified and culturally appropriate, diets that are acceptable um, as a key part of health in all forms. And furthermore, where countries have elaborated their own national dietary guidelines, they are an official policy standard for what constitutes dietary needs. Um, a lot of times social safety nets and nutrition education are based on this standard. So it's very consistent to um, look at the cost of meeting that standard, uh, which in many cases is the recommended you know, official um, standard for all. So when we calculate these metrics, our aim is to determine if you went to an average market in a given country, how much would it cost to obtain a diet that satisfies dietary guidelines? In this case, other metrics are used to, um, to determine what it would take to satisfy nutrient requirements alone. And then how many people could not afford that cost? We can think about this in terms of a stairway of affordability. Um, you know, thanks to Will for initially creating this visualization to illustrate the idea that um, in, in principle, when, all, when diets are affordable, uh, we know that food prices are just one of many influences on food choice. Just being able to afford a healthy diet doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to consume one. But when healthy diets are unaffordable, that food prices are an insurmountable barrier to improve diet quality. And so trying to educate people to choose healthy diets when they simply can't afford them is not going to be successful and requires um, other ways to improve access than, than just education alone. And we can think about this uh, stairway as sort of starting with the short-term subsistence goal of calorie adequacy has uh, for quite a long time been, been mistaken for food security. And we aim to um, kind of expand that vision, uh, understanding of food security beyond just the first step 
of calorie adequacy. Uh, we can think of it in terms of uh, the next step being nutrient adequacy, just avoiding deficiencies or excesses of essential nutrients. This is done in the, uh, the cost of the diet approach used by World Food Program in intervention planning, uh, filling the nutrient gap, understanding where specific nutrients are, are too expensive. Um, but this metric alone doesn't quite provide the you know, market-based um, uh, way of understanding what people actually see in the market in terms of food items and food groups that can meet um, dietary guidelines, which is captured in the healthy diet step to meet food group recommendations, which we consider a minimum for food security. And then there's an additional step, of course, that you don't just usually, most people probably in this meeting do not spend the minimum cost of, um, that would be required to meet a healthy diet and food group recommendations, but satisfy other goals as well. Uh, so spend a little bit more to have increased convenience or to choose foods that are more desirable. Um, and this, as uh, we'll just briefly touch on later, may be an appropriate standard for poverty lines in meeting um, more of the food preferences aspect. I want to emphasize that we are referring here to least cost diets that means that the diet cost in each place is based on the cheapest combination of foods that meets the criteria for the diet. So there's no standard set of items. Um, there's no basket that is, you know, a, a discrete set of specific items which are costed over time. Rather, the food items are chosen by whatever is locally available or seasonal uh, whatever is least cost in the specific time and place to determine um, if you went to that market at that time on that day, uh, what would be the, the least cost way to, um, in this case, meet the dietary guidelines. So these indicators provide a lower bound on the cost per day of meeting the dietary standard. And then again, taste and preferences and convenience would add to the cost and would raise the estimate of people who can't afford the diet. So we're really dealing with just the, the lower floor. To show what this looks like, um, here's an example from India where uh, we look at the least cost items in a particular time point that were selected across different states. And so uh, it just so happens that at this, at this time when the data were collected, uh, when we look at the least cost fruit items, <clears throat> banana turns out to be the least cost, one of the least cost fruits in every state. Uh, we do see that a lot, that banana comes out as, as a least cost item often, but that the other least cost fruits can are, are variable here. Sometimes it's guava, sometimes it's papaya, uh, sometimes pineapple, um, sometimes mango. And so this just illustrates that it just depends on, you know, the specific market where you are, what is the least cost item? And that we don't choose just one item uh, because for understanding the, the least cost of meeting dietary guidelines, there's a requirement for diversity. So we also want to choose, um, in most cases, more than one food to ensure that diversity is, uh, is also met. As we'll see in uh, Rachel's presentation later, uh, she'll discuss this a little bit more, but the cost of a healthy diet can be calculated in essentially two ways um, based on two standards. There is uh, There are national standards, so it's certainly um, possible and in many cases very appropriate to calculate the cost of a healthy diet based on adherence to a set of national dietary guidelines. And this would be really useful for policy coherence within a country to answer the question of you know, what actions in the food system and agriculture need to be taken perhaps to improve access to healthy diets as defined by our own national dietary guidelines. When we talk about the global analysis or sometimes analyses in countries that do not have dietary guidelines, we can use a global approach that we call the healthy diet basket. And this is a global standard set of criteria that represents commonalities across most dietary guidelines globally which was created for the purpose of calculating and comparing the cost and affordability of healthy diets across countries. And this is a necessary standard for comparisons um, as has been used in the 
state of food security and nutrition in the world reports uh, so that we don't have, you know, we're not trying to compare different countries against different standards, but using one standard to assess how affordable or not the a healthy diet is across countries. To explain a little bit more about that global standard, what we have done is taken a number of quantified dietary guidelines from countries and looked at the average recommendations across, across all of them. So kind of if you stacked all of these one on top of the other and looked for what's the um, average proportion coming through that stack, if they're you know, translucent and you're looking through them, you would come out with something that looks like what's in the center, which is the uh, proportions and food groups in the healthy diet basket. And to make sure that it is a fairly representative standard of many different guidelines. We also looked at guidelines that are not quantified, that represent food group proportions um, pictorially in food guides, and essentially found that the um, standard proportions that come out as the average, they do reflect the commonalities across guidelines where approximately as a rule of thumb, about half of the volume is fruits and vegetables and about a quarter of the volume is starchy staples and about a quarter of the volume is protein rich foods defined between animal source and plant source protein rich foods with a small proportion in oils and fats. And I just put Canada's guideline here as a more beautiful representation of that than, than our pie chart. But you can see there clearly, the um, this is really kind of the mode of what comes across through countries in terms of basic um, food group proportions, and that's captured in the healthy diet basket standard. When we apply this standard, um, as you'll see in the activity, we first of all use these six food groups of starchy staples, vegetables, fruits, animal source foods, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and oils and fats. And we choose a number of food items in each of these categories. So two starchy staples, three vegetables and two fruits to satisfy diversity requirements, two animal source foods, one legume, nut or seed, and one oil. And we choose um, an energy value, a, a amount of uh, dietary energy uh, here using calories in a standard way so that the proportions are um, as shown here between the food groups. And then as a next step, we can look at when we, once we find the cost, uh, the cost of you know, selecting these, what turns out to be 11 items and a standard calorie amount. When we find the cost of that, we can then look at the affordability, which is a comparison of the cost relative to a defined income standard. And this can be done in a few different ways. Um, most commonly, we would compare the cost to income, to total income. Uh, we can also compare the cost to wages or to food expenditures as different ways of looking at food affordability. So if we want to answer the question of how many people cannot afford it, the healthy diet, uh, we start with um, kind of an assumption of reserving 52% of expenditures for food and the other 48% for non-food uh, essentials, because this amount of expenditures on food is actually the average that people in low income countries spend. And we can compare the cost of, of the diet to 52% of income. Um, since if, if we have the total income, we wanna see of the amount reserved for food, does that allow for um, purchasing the least cost healthy diet? And to do this, we use um, a global food price data set, which is actually a unique data set. There is only one uh, global food price data set, which comes from the World Bank International Comparison Program, the most recent version of which was from 2017. And it includes uh, a large number of 680 foods and beverages across 173 countries. And using this data set, that's the source of the statistic that about 3 billion people around the world lack sufficient income to purchase least cost healthy diets. Majority are focused, are concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. We can also use other data sources 
and Rachel will talk a little bit more about this today. We can compare the, uh, the cost to food expenditures and look at the observed per capita food expenditure per day from national accounts. We can look at the cost, if the cost, for an example, if the cost of a healthy diet per capita is um, $3.11, this actually comes from an Ethiopia example from 2017, an actual food expenditure per capita is what people actually usually spend on food is $1.42. What we find is that the healthy diet costs more than twice as much as what people usually spend on food expenditures. So concluding that the cost of a healthy diet is 219% of the observed expenditures per capita per day. So that's another way to look at food affordability. Uh, we can look at which elements of the diet are least affordable. And globally, what we see is that starchy staples and oils account for less than 20% of the total cost. We see fruits and vegetables accounting for a high proportion of the cost, also animal source foods. Um, so you can imagine that this is what people are not buying if they cannot afford a healthy diet, uh, that the, the staples are probably going to come first and the rest of the diversity in the diet is going to be um, compromised. So uh, here's the, yes, here's the other price data sources um, that I forgot where it was in the slide deck, but we do have other data sources we can use besides the global one for looking at the cost and affordability of healthy diets. Um, in countries, we can use national statistical office data for um, the consumer price index. This is typically um, very frequently collected data or other market information systems. For an example of what can be done with national data, you could look at the variability across, across geography. Um, here's an example from Pakistan, looking at where healthy diets are more expensive or less expensive. And then you can look within that to see what are the food groups that are most variable, in this case, vegetables, dairy, and fruit. And then furthermore, you can use your own data. So you can use retail, price, retail prices um, that are collected within research studies or within projects. Um, if you are using your own data, just a couple of rule, rules of thumb, the data should include several different items from each food group um, of standard quality. This is how national statistical offices collect their data, choosing a quality standard that's not premium and not discount. Um, they should be items that are commonly consumed in lower income households. And you probably need at least 20 or 30 foods, if not more, um, to get you know, a, a sample that can, from which you can select least cost, the least cost 11 items required for the indicator. Um, so that there's some variability to select from in price and having that diversity within each food group. So the next activity we're gonna to move to here is demonstrating how to calculate the cost of healthy diet from your own data or from other data. Uh, we have a standard data set to use for practice, but you'll be able to see how you could enter your own data and start to use that to calculate the indicator. So I'll stop here and I think turn it over back to Will. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Thank thanks, Anna. So an enormously rich toolkit here to work with um, but it all starts with you and with your own sense, your own understanding of what we're doing. So we have five minutes planned till five past the hour, just for a little bit of discussion to digest what Anna shared before we turn to the actual method to calculate. Okay, so we're about to turn to Rachel Gilbert leading us through the actual calculation. But first, let's think conceptually, what are we doing and discuss that a little bit. So the goal here is to uh, identify the least costly items in each food group that would meet the dietary standards set by national dietary guidelines. So let's start with vegetables. Vegetables I know are Anna's favorite food group, <laughs> having done ethnobotany to think about uh, particularly green leafy vegetables across Africa, enormous variety of species, um, but it's not just green leafy vegetables, all the pumpkins and gourds and every kind of um, vegetable. You know that dietary guidelines from what Anna just shared recommend about a quarter of the plate should be those. 
that the diversity within vegetables, about three different items, that on average, you're looking for about 350 grams. But we also know that vegetables have completely different amounts of water in them. So if your quarter of your plate has in it, for example, zucchini, courgette, or um, uh, cucumber, that's full of water. Um, or even a tomato is a lot of water. But when we were looking at items, somebody mentioned getting cherry tomatoes. So cherry tomatoes have about twice as much tomato per water. So cherry tomatoes have very little water in them compared to a, a large tomato. So we actually use calories because no one buys vegetables for the calories. You buy vegetables for the vegetable, but how much vegetable is there in cucumber or a whole tomato, big tomato versus a small tomato, that is given by the amount of tomato calories. So it's 110 calories of vegetables from three different vegetables. And the question to ask in the chat for just a minute here is just what do you think is the least expensive vegetable that you could buy right now? Okay, so just list the name of that vegetable that would be the least expensive way of getting vegetable calories. So if it's cucumbers, it's a lot of water. If it's spinach, that's huh? moist spinach, fresh spinach, it's a lot of water, but maybe you have dried amaranth uh, leaves in your community. Maybe you have um, some relatively inexpensive uh, vegetables. And we'll talk a little bit about which ones tend to be the cheapest. So we actually have just one more minute for this. Uh, and Rachel, you're in charge to think about the best timing to start in on the transition to quantitative. But Rachel, if you can just take this list that people are typing, it's such an interesting diverse list of items that might be the cheapest might be the least expensive, might be the measure of access to vegetables in your country. Great. Yeah, there's a lot of great answers and a lot of uh, similarity in the answers that we're getting across groups. This is really interesting. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, I am going to share my screen and we're going to jump right into the actual calculation of the cost of a healthy diet. Can you all see my screen now? Yeah, I'll assume yes. Great, so yes, I am Rachel Gilbert. I'm here at Tufts as well, and really excited to be walking through the next part of the learning lab with you on calculating the cost of a healthy diet. Um, so for the next hour or so, we're going to be working on the manual calculation of this. And what I wanna do is start by giving you a big picture of how to calculate the cost of a healthy diet, Anna introduced you to the indicator. We'll explain a little bit more about it. But before we get into the actual details of how do you calculate Excel, I'll just give you a quick step-by-step -step through, um, there we go, how to do so. Then we'll do the step-by-step -step demonstration in Excel. And I'd encourage, if you'd like to, you can follow along. Um, Christina will share the activity in the chat so you can download it and follow along if that's useful for you as I walk through the Excel. Um, we'll leave a little bit of time for um, questions after we go through an activity with example data. We're going to give you a chance to practice in groups and breakout rooms. Um, and then after that, I'm going to share a full toolkit that we've put together, the Food Forces for Nutrition team has put together for calculating the cost of a healthy diet. So this is an example that we're going to work through together. And then at the end of this, you'll leave with a toolkit that you can use on your own with a lot more um, rich information on how to use it. And the slides that I'm about to show you are using the Excel workbook from the toolkit. It's exactly the same as what you use for the activity, but for the activity, we'll just use a slightly smaller data set. Um, so don't let that throw you off. We're gonna be doing the same thing that I'm about to demonstrate you, um, to you here in Excel. Again, I wanna start with this big picture view before we get into this nitty gritty step-by-step -step in the Excel workbook. So to calculate the cost of a healthy diet, which is, as Will and Anne have told you, the minimum cost to meet food-based dietary guidelines or another diet criteria like the healthy diet basket, you have to start by selecting that standard, right? So you have pot potentially a national food-based dietary guideline, or maybe you're using the healthy diet basket to compare across countries. You'll select that standard at the very beginning. 
Then you have your food price list. And what you need to do is classify each food into a food group. So let's say the first item in your list is watermelon. You start by assigning watermelon to the fruit food group. Then you need to know the recommended amount to purchase per day for each food. And this is at the end of individual level. So we're looking at the amount that a average healthy woman would need to consume in a day. And so what we're gonna be looking at is if it's recommended that you eat a certain number of calories from fruit each day, how much watermelon do you need to buy to meet that recommendation? So as Will was saying, what you need to purchase depends on how much you actually need to eat and how much of that food is actually edible. So in order to eat a certain amount of watermelon today, let's say 160 calories of watermelon, you'll need to think about, okay, I maybe need to buy 500 grams of watermelon. Then you'll remember, oh, there's a lot of rind in a watermelon. I'm gonna have to throw some of that away. I'll need to buy maybe closer to a full kilogram of watermelon. So this step is really thinking about the, recommend, in the amount that you need to purchase per day to get that recommended amount that you're gonna consume. Then, after that, you need to calculate the cost per day. So you have retail prices, that's the amount that the, pr the price the consumer would actually face in the market. And you know that quantity, the recommended amount of purchase that you just calculated. And together with the price and the quantity, we can find the cost per day for each food. Then you'll select the least expensive food items from your list based on the food groups and the cost per day. And then you'll sum the cost per day for each food group. And that is the cost of a healthy diet. So I want you to have this overall process in mind as we go through the steps in Excel. Um, it's a lot of information quickly, but I hope that will help you follow along and hopefully you can follow along as well if you'd like to using the Excel workbook. Um, and I'll just say that we've spent quite a lot of time actually trying to make this process even easier, we have a database to help with the steps of classifying foods into food groups based on the specific standard that you've selected, and also to help you calculate the recommended amount that a person would have to purchase per day. So now I'm going to walk you through using the Excel workbook to calculate the cost of a healthy diet. The slides that I'm about to show you are from the full workbook that's part of our toolkit. Um, your activity is the same. It just has a slightly smaller data set. So the first thing that you'll see when you open up the uh, Excel workbook is you'll find this sheet which shows you the instructions. And as I'm walking through this, you'll see that up in the top right-hand corner, I'm showing you the sheet that we're on. So you're on the instruction sheet. And then along the bottom here, you can also see that we've highlighted the workbook sheet in like a thick gray border so you can follow along. And importantly, the first thing you do on this page, bright yellow here is select a dietary guideline or a standard to calculate the cost of. And so you could select your own country's food-based dietary guideline, the healthy diet basket, etc. And there are sort of simple instructions here. We have a much more detailed set of instructions in the full toolkit, which we'll share with you at the end of the learning lab, you don't need them right now for the activity, but we have spent um, some time putting together detailed instructions, which are summarized here for you in the Excel workbook. Quickly on to the next sheet, you're now on the price data sheet of the workbook. And once you open the activity, you will see that there's no data here. You're gonna put in that data because this is where you would use your own data. Right here, we're showing you just an example, um, but this is the price data sheet um that you'll start with it's that right after the instruction sheet you would copy your own price data here and you can do so in the same format which is sort of a what is called a long format where in this example each row represents a single price observation so in a at one time which is the date of measurement in one market which is the market id for a single food item in a specific unit, in a specific currency. So that's what this example data set is showing you. It's each row here in your price data set is a single observation. And you may have data sets that you've been working with on your own that are a little bit different than this. You could, for example, have 
each row might be instead of a single food item in a single market, you might have an average price in a region or a district or a town. So this isn't what all price data looks like, but this is the example that we'll be working through. So you would paste your price data here um, in the Excel workbook. And again, you can see that we have multiple markets here. So we have, we're going from market one to market two, and we have 78, 79 food and beverage items here. You can see that we have monthly dates in this workbook, and you can also use other formats. If you have daily data or weekly data, that's also fine. This example just happens to have monthly data. In the next sheet, what we're doing, we're now in the market characteristics sheet of the workbook. Here you have the opportunity to assign each market to a unique market ID that corresponds to what you just saw in the price data sheet. So let me just go back and show you again. In that column B there, we have the market ID. Those are gonna match the market IDs in the market characteristic sheet. In the activity, there's not much that you need to do here. But um, in the market characteristic sheet, we have the opportunity to provide more information about each market. Remember that in this example, we really are talking about a single marketplace. This is fake data. So we're just pretending that this is a single market with a name in a certain location in a certain set of administrative areas. So you can provide that information here. Now, if you had a regional average price, you could change the market ID to say region one, region two, region three, for example. But this is just where you can make sure that you have all the information describing the markets that you're working with so you can aggregate up at a later date. Maybe you wanna talk about things at the province level. The next sheet, now we're on the items, units of measure sheet. And what we have, <clears throat> what we have here is conversion factors to take prices which are in non-standard units. So things like cans or packets or bags and to convert them into kilogram units. So, I'm sure you have all been to markets where things are sold in packets. You don't know exactly how many kilograms are in it, but we need to have the standard price per kilogram in order to calculate the cost of a healthy diet. So here is where you'll have a single line represents, a single row represents an item and its unit of measure. So these would be things that are also in the price data sheet. And here you'll see the conversion for kilo, to do a kilogram is just one. It is the, but we have that line here to represent that that's an observation that exists in this data set. So you'll be filling in some of these in the activity. And what you wanna do is figure out how many kilograms are in a can of beans. And this would depend obviously on where you are and the price data that you have. But for the example, you can use your imagination a little bit. And these actual price conversions are occurring a little bit later on in the Excel workbook. So this is just where you're keeping track of how you would convert prices in non-standard units to kilogram units. And I'll show you in a bit, in just a minute where the conversion factors end up. So now we are on the food matching sheet. And on the food matching sheet, you'll see a familiar list of foods. So this assists you in matching food items from your price data sheet to food items which are in the recommended amounts database. Earlier, I told you that we have a database to help you find the recommended amount to purchase per day. I'll explain a bit more in just a moment. But what this sheet is doing is helping you match items that are in your food price list to this recommended amounts database, which takes into account food composition data. So what you're doing here is retrieving information from the recommended amounts database on that recommended amount to purchase on the food group classification. So you need to know for eat for, you know, let's say you're talking about the healthy diet basket. Anna showed you those food groups that are used for the healthy diet basket. You want to make sure you're categorizing each food in this food list into a food group that corresponds to that standard. And You'll also get information on the number of foods that need to be selected for each food group. So as Anna also said, and Will mentioned, there's three vegetables that are selected in the least cost diet because we wanna make sure that we have diversity within the vegetable food group. So you'll also get that information from the recommended amounts database. And before I go into exactly how the matching sheet works, 
The recommended amounts database identifies, again, I just mentioned this, but the food group classification, the amount to consume per day, the amount to purchase per day, which incorporates the edible portion, I'll show you in just a moment, and the number of foods to be selected per food group per day. We have this done for a list of about 300 foods and for multiple food-based dietary guidelines that have been quantified. If you're doing this with your own price data set, not for today, but if you're doing this later on with your own price data set, there may be items that you have in your food price list where there's no information for those in the recommended amounts database, and that's okay. You can add, if you have food composition data on those items, you can add them to the recommended amounts database and it will help you calculate the recommended amount to purchase per day. So I just wanna highlight that for later on. But this is what the recommended amounts database looks like. And this is already in the workbook and in the activity for you. So you can see, I mentioned watermelon before, what this sheet shows you is the, let's say in columns K through um, O, you can see that we're looking at the healthy diet basket. You get the food group acronym, the number of foods and the recommended amount to purchase per day. And we also here have the edible portion. So you can think through that um, on your own and you can see, okay, uh, only about half of a watermelon is actually edible. The other part isn't. How does that affect the amount to consume versus the amount to purchase? Getting back to what the food matching sheet does is this helps you with drop downs to select the item that's in the recommended amount database that corresponds to the items you have in your own food price list. So there's drop downs here. You can start in column C and then in the generic food category and move through to um, column E where there's the food item name. And you're just matching that item as best you can. In this example, you have sort of limited information. Beans in, call, in uh, row, row two is, a fairly uh, non-specific word. So it's up to you in this case, you can use your imagination. How am I gonna make this match? Once you do that, once you make the food match, columns F through I will automatically populate with the information from the recommended amounts database. So you don't actually need to manually type anything there. You'll see that um, the Excel workbook automatically does that for you. And again, this is just how the dropdowns work. So once you select legumes in column C, you'll have a subset of items to choose from for column D. And then the same thing will happen for column E. So once you choose kidney beans in column D, you have an option, you only have one option left here in E. So this just helps facilitate the process of the matching. And again, that will automatically populate once you do the matching. So what you'll end up with is a sheet that looks something like this, where all of the food items are matched and unmatched items or excluded items that aren't recommended will just be marked with gray empty cells to help you see what's not gonna be included um, based on what you were able to match. And if you can't match something because you don't have food composition data, that's okay. Now we've moved on to the merge data set sheet. This is taking all of the information from other sheets, from the price data, the market characteristics, the items, units of measure, and bringing it all into one data set for the analysis. So it's pulling in all of that information from other sheets, and it's using that information to calculate important components. So for example, the cost per day of the purchase amount, this is what I just mentioned, combining the price that you've input with the recommended amount to purchase to get the cost per day. And the merge data set is, taking in all that information and doing this for you. And it's automatically um, selecting the least cost items in each food group based on the cost per day. And it has a few other features that are um, important for making sure that we have diversity. So for example, if we have three different types of rice in our data set, it's gonna drop the most expensive rice items, keep the least cost rice item. So we're not accidentally selecting instead of um, two different grains where, or starchy staples, we'd be selecting two rices. We don't want to do that. So this merge data set does all of that for you using the information that you've put in in the initial sheets. Finally, we get to the cost of a healthy diet sheet of the workbook. And this sheet pulls the data from the merge data set to show you the selected least cost items. So in each time and place, in each date of measurement and market ID, you're getting a different basket of least cost items that are selected.
based on the information that you've provided. So you're going to get a, for a least cost diet basket for a given market and date, organized by the food groups and showing each food selected. You'll get the quantity that was purchased and the cost per day for that food. So this is all happening in the final sheet. And it's also all happening automatically with the small caveat that you'll often have to press the refresh all button on the data um, tab of the Excel workbook if, you've, if you want to yeah, update the results. So that's just a little caveat. You'll wanna remember that for the end of the activity. And um, because you'll be putting in your own price data, it's not already in there. You'll wanna make sure that you select keep um, in the cell B2. This is gonna just show you only the least cost items that were selected instead of all items. So you just wanna see the least cost diet basket at the end. And that is all I have for you on the activity demonstration. I'm going to hand it over to Christina to talk you through getting started in the activity, and we'll put you in breakout rooms for that. I know I've given you a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, we'll be popping into your breakout rooms so we can help you with this. And really, trust me, we want to hear all of your questions if you're confused. We want to improve it so it's less confusing. Please um, feel free to ask questions and and work together to think through how how to do this activity. So, Christina, go ahead. Thanks, Rachel. And hi, everyone. My name is Christina. I'm really glad to be with all of you today. Um, so, what we'll do now is we'll launch into an activity where you'll actually get to calculate cost of a healthy diet yourself. Uh, this will give you a chance to get familiar with one of our tools, one of the software that we have publicly available, and simulate what it would be like to use retail food price data, so a list of foods and price observations, to generate this indicator for a given time in a given place. In a few minutes, you will join a small group and use the resources we've provided. I'm about to uh, enter it into the chat if you haven't already had a chance to download it. So you'll use these resources to take a look for yourself. You'll have about 20 minutes to do this activity. And at the end of the process, you'll be more familiar with what a research team, a national statistical office, a ministry or another agency could use to figure out what is the least cost healthy diet in my area or population. I'll quickly um, give you an overview of what you'll see step by step uh, and what you'll try to try to accomplish during the course of this exercise. But of course, no big deal. You get as far as you can and uh, we reconvene afterwards to discuss. So it's really just just for just for your uh, benefit, just to practice. So Yes, the first thing you'll do is you'll download those materials. So uh, if you haven't, take a look in the, in the chat and click the link to head to the shared drive. And next, you'll open the activity Excel sheet. You'll notice there's two of them. One of them is locked. That's totally normal. It's the answer key and it'll be available at the end. But you'll download the non-locked activity Excel and you'll open it up. And the first thing that you'll do in the first tab is you'll select the standard that you'll be using to run this calculation. Here, go ahead and select healthy diet basket as your standard. This is the global standard that Anna um, was, was mentioning earlier. Otherwise you could select, uh, you know, in other scenarios, you could select a national food-based dietary guideline. If it's quantified, it's in our sheet and available for you all. The third step is you will provide all the necessary information. Um, so you'll, you'll import food price data from a different Excel into this Excel workbook. This will set you up in order to be able to fill in the rest of the missing pieces and run your calculation at the end of the exercise. Once you've added your food price data, you'll standardize the units, making sure that we convert foods that are sold in different units, so packets, cans, containers, we'll standardize those units to kilograms for all foods so we can put them on a level playing field. And next you will match these foods. So what you'll do is you will take some of the missing, uh, some of the missing areas here, you see them in, in gray boxes, 
and you will match them to an existing database. And what this does is it enables the software to recognize important things like the edible portion of a food, the recommended amount to purchase and consume uh, for each of the foods in your list. And the very last step is you will head to the final tab there uh, and you will press refresh. What this does is it takes all the information that you've entered and it calculates the least cost healthy diet in a given time, in a given place. So you'll have these instructions as part of the uh, package that you can also access. So don't worry if you haven't retained all of this, it's okay. Um, we'll just reiterate that, you know, the goal here is really just to fill in the, the missing boxes. So it's a short exercise to give you a chance to, to yeah, to try and, try and um, fill in the gaps in, in an Excel uh, spreadsheet that's already partially filled in and simulated for you. And you have your, your materials as mentioned, and you'll work in teams. So you can choose how you do this. You know, in your team, you can choose if you wanna assign one person to share the screen, and then the rest of the group guides that person um, and sort of uh, does, it, does it as a, as a, yeah, as a group. Um, or you can decide to, you know, work individually. Maybe that's your preference and, and talk through each step together, making sure you help each other um, where, where you can. And of course, we're here to help you if you have any questions. So uh, all of the instructions I'm, I'm giving you now, you know, they, they are here in the activity instructions. More importantly, the screenshots and slides that Rachel just walked you through, they're also available as part of this package. So you can always refer back to those screenshots um, for, for, yeah, a helpful hint as to what to do next. And in the case that you want a little extra support, don't hesitate. You can use the bottom bar of your Zoom platform to ask for help once you're in the breakout room. So you can just call one of us in and, and we'll head on in and make sure that uh, you have what you need to, to finish up. So that's it for me. Um, we will now break into the groups. Before so we do that, Christina, I just wanna comment on where this activity sits in kind of the, the history of the ANH Academy Learning Labs. Um, it really follows what Will said at the beginning of this kind of maturation of what we've learned and can share over the years. We started, we've done this learning lab, I don't know how many times, at least five. And in the beginning, we were using a single sheet of printed paper um, to demonstrate how to calculate the cost of a healthy diet, which you can do by hand. It's simple enough. It's not a linear program. It doesn't require statistical software. You can do it by hand by just knowing the cost per day of a variety of items and choosing the least cost items and then adding them up. And so that's what we did in the beginning of these learning labs to demonstrate the concept. But then people couldn't really take that very easily and apply it because there was this bottleneck of understanding how to convert prices in the market to prices per day that meet recommendations. If I buy a watermelon in the market, what's the cost? It's not what's the cost per kg, it's what's the cost of the amount of watermelon that I need to purchase that meets the recommendation for fruit. So that step, we never were able to really fully um, communicate quickly in the beginning and now having built this tool, this Excel sheet that, um, that Rachel and Christina went through, it is really a, you know, an evolution of you being able to fully do this with your own data. So not just try to follow what's written in a research paper, but actually have the tool. This is the first year that we've been able to share a fully functional um, method and tool for uh, for everyone to actually, you know, download this and use it for yourself if you want to calculate this indicator from your own data. Uh, so thanks. I'll yeah. Let's go into the activity. But I wanted to comment on where we've come from and uh, where we've gotten over the years with with this project and the learning labs. Super. Let's uh, let's kick it off, uh, Lena. I think we're ready. We'll have about uh, yeah, fifteen minutes, fifteen to twenty minutes to try it out. And we'll be jumping into the rooms intermittently to, to see if we can lend a hand. Yeah, and download the whole folder. I think some people are trying to download the individual sheets, but you can download the whole folder. And it's in the 
the document is the activity. There's a completed activity, which you can't see because we don't want you to see the completed activity, but it's in there. So don't, you won't be able to open that, but you can open the one that's just called activity. So that should, if you download the whole folder, I think that should be possible. Um, please stay here and let us know if you have any issues doing that. Okay, great. So I just wanna debrief quickly from this activity. Um, there's a couple important things I wanna say as we wrap up. The first thing is, I wanna emphasize again, that this is just example data. This is pseudo data. It's not representative of any country or time, which means that these results are just an example for you to see how the Excel works. It's just an activity. Your price data may look really different and that's okay. You may have things at different levels instead of the market level. You may have something at the regional level or you may have multiple prices for a single food item that you wanna, that you wanna keep. That's okay. We're not saying that this is the only way to do it. It's just an example. Um, and the, obviously the results that you get on the final page of the activity are not necessarily prices that would exist anywhere. Um, but I also wanna emphasize that many of you asked about on the item units of measure sheet, like how do I know what the conversion factor is for a loaf of bread or an egg? And in this case, you don't have the information that you fully need to get the best answer because you need to know what country you're in what market you're in, you need to know more about how the price data was collected. But for this example, what I always suggest is just, you can just Google for this, for this specific activity, like how many grams are in a loaf of bread? I would have said about 400. So the conversion factor would be 0.4. So there's about 0.4 kgs in a loaf of bread, but it depends where you are and what items are actually being collected. So you would need more information to do this perfectly. Um, and that's why I want to say there's no like right answer. We'll unlock the completed activity the way we did it. Um, and the same thing goes for food matching. Like you really don't have enough information to match beans. That's just not enough information to know exactly what the food composition of beans is. But in this case, you can imagine you're in a specific time and place, what beans might be the most commonly consumed. And that's what you would match it with. So when you're using your own data, it will be a very different activity. You'll know a lot more about um, what each item is, and it will be easier to match and find the conversion factors. Um, and I really wanna emphasize that these, I'm gonna share the full toolkit with you in just a moment. These are living documents and we're improving them. So we love your feedback. Um, if there's something that could be clearer, um, please let us know, but also please do check the version numbers because we're improving these as we go. And so what we're sharing with you today is based on the second version, but we're really, these are, um, constantly being improved. So we want um, to make sure that you have the updated version. And to make sure that um, you have that, I'm gonna share with you the full technical assistance toolkit that we've put together for calculating the cost of a healthy diet. I think Christine is gonna share in the chat the link to that. And that's a different folder, which has all of the materials and the full Excel workbook with um, instructions and the like for calculating the cost of a healthy diet with your own data. Um, it will look very similar to the activity. But when we share that with you, again, you'll see it's a slightly different link here. You can do the same thing. You can download the folder contents to your computer. You don't need to do this now. This is just for your perusal after the learning lab. You can check the version number. So as I mentioned, these are the this is version two. You can use the most recent version. And then there's a change log which shares what was improved between different versions. So that's how this is a this is a permanent link. Like if you go in three weeks to this link, bit.ly slash calculating cost of a healthy diet, you will see the most recent materials that we've shared. So this is a go-to link for you. We'll share it again in the chat and we'll share it um, in the follow-up materials for the learning lab for you all to keep an eye on. Um, and you'll also notice in here that there is an option for using Stata as well. We didn't go into that today because as you can see, it's also, it's already um, a lot to do in one day. So take a look at that if you're interested and you can always reach out to us with questions. Um, and yeah, I just wanna emphasize, you can start by reading the full set of instructions. The instructions that you saw in the Excel workbook and then the activity are abbreviated. We spent a lot more time fleshing out the instructions for you to do it in Excel and in Stata. There are two different workflows um, and we have step-by-step -step guidance for both. So. That's all there for you in addition to the activity that we just shared. 
and the completed activity um, for you to look at after the learning lab and to reach out to us with any questions. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. There were some questions in the chat that we might, uh, we might address. Yeah. Yeah, I think both um, the latest ones there from Elizabeth and Suparna are definitely worth bringing up uh, in plenary. So I wrote in the chat the list, but there are kind of standard exclusions. Uh, basically, you exclude things that wouldn't fit into the food groups of the dietary guidelines. So if you're thinking of, you know, um, a, a fruit category, you're thinking of what kinds of items would satisfy eating, you know, the guideline is something like 250 grams of fruit. What would you eat in a quantity of 250 grams that would meet dietary guidelines? So you would, you would include like, you know, bananas, watermelons, things that you typically eat as a fruit, but you would exclude lemons, which are botanically a fruit, but most people don't eat like 250 grams of lemon because its primary function is as a flavoring. So you would exclude things that just don't really fit within the categories towards meeting the guidelines. You'd exclude mixed foods and non-caloric items. Um, basically that's the rule, anything that doesn't fit into the, the uh, food groups. And then Suparna's question, um, we, the recommended amounts database uses the USDA food composition table uh, for the most part, there are some items that we draw from the West African food composition table where they do not exist in the USDA. And it's um, a lot of people ask about, can we use our own food composition tables? And I would just say that it's not really necessary because we're not looking at a detailed nutrient analysis here. All we're doing is finding the edible portion and calorie content of different, different foods. And so, you know, if you take the example of maize flour, in every uh, food composition table, it has a hundred percent edible portion, and it will have uh, within a few calories of each other the same energy composition. So we can just use the USDA because it has the basic information that we need for this exercise, which is just edible portion and calories, where the item does not exist in the recommended amounts database, then we might have to enter information from other food composition tables. Rachel, did you wanna say anything about how people can actually do that? That's a, it is possible within, within the um, Excel file to do. Yeah, I don't think we have time to go over it now, but we have written out pretty, what I hope are um, straightforward instructions in that instructions document for how to do so. And, Again, I, our contact information is in that instructions document as well. And if you're having trouble, just email us and we can try and help you. Um, but there are instructions for how you can do that um, already. So I think we'll skip that. I do just want to mention also that the way the food matching tab works, if an item, once you've selected a food-based dietary guideline, the information that comes into the food matching tab as you do the food matches incorporates specific information from that dietary guideline. So you can exclude things manually using the drop downs, which say exclude, and then there's a sub a, a bunch of categories. But I also showed you that there's like grayed out lines where information doesn't come in. That happens when something is not recommended in that food-based dietary guideline as well. And in the folder that we've shared with you with the full toolkit, we have a bunch of information on the food-based dietary guidelines that comes from the food-based dietary guidelines themselves. Those, some of, like some of that information is what is included in each of these food groups and that's stipulated by dietary guidelines. So we've transferred that into the recommended amounts database in the food matching sheet. But of course, there's no substitute for you knowing the food-based dietary guideline that you are trying to find the cost of a healthy diet for. That's very important. So you would then exclude items manually if you needed to as well, you could. And we have another good question um, Elizabeth raised about uh, not finding the exact food match. And yes, just to say what to do in that situation is you, you want to select the food match that most closely matches the general um, calorie content and edible portion. So for example, if you had um, in, the, in the food price item list, if you had something that said beef with bones, you want to select a food match that also has bones because it's the edible portion will come out 
more similar than if you selected, you know, cubed beef or something that has no, uh, that has 100% edible portion, whereas the bones make it less than 100% edible portion. So when you're, um, when you're doing a food match, you want to be thinking about the most similar items in terms of edible portion and calories. Great. Yeah. I think it's actually time to move on from the activity. I'm sure people have questions and we'll spend more time messing around with the activity and the work, um, the workbook, but for now, I think, and if you actually just want to introduce the next section, we'll be moving into the policy. Yeah. Um, so we have Dr. Olutayo Adeyemi here with us to talk about some policy applications of the indicators. And this is the part where we get to talk about why we do this. Um, why find the cost of a healthy diet? What can you do with that information? And how can that be useful for um, understanding in a situation, planning, programs, policies, interventions, and uh, shifting conversations and dialogue? So over to, over to you, Tayo. Thank you for uh, being here and part of the team from, from the Nigeria team. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about the subnational monitoring of cost of healthy diet in Nigeria and how we are using the cost of healthy diet in Nigeria. Um, I'm an associate lecturer with the University of Ibadan, but I also provide support, or I mainly provide support to the Ministry of Agriculture on nutrition and food systems. Okay, um, so. Uh, the idea of using the cost of healthy diet actually came out of a learning lab like this in 2018. So um, several of us from Nigeria working on nutrition and food systems attended the ANH Academy week in Accra. And then we approached the food prices for nutrition team to say, this is going to be a very useful metric for us. We would like to know how um, we can work on this using our national data. And that was how we, we started working with the um, food prices for nutrition team. And so one of the first things we have done is to analyze the Nigerian Living Standard Survey. Um, and this is with support from the food prices for nutrition team, um, as well as collaborators at Van Geningen University. And so this survey collects um, price data and expenditure data among um, other um, indicators for all the 36 states of Nigeria, um, as well as the federal capital territory. And so we've been able to um, determine the cost and affordability of healthy diets um, in Nigeria. There are other um, researchers, especially at the World Food Program, um, that have also used the same living standard survey, but then they also collected primary data across the entire country, and they've also estimated the cost of healthy diets as um, using their primary data. Um, so what, one of the things that we've used the analysis we've already done for is to assess the performance of the Nigerian food system um, compared with the food system in other um, countries. So uh, Nigeria um, very actively participated in the United Nations uh, Food System Summits. Um, and we held a lot of dialogues and um, developed a national food systems transformation strategy. And so one of the things that came up um, repeatedly during the dialogues was that food was very expensive. And so the Ministry of Budget and National Planning um, has adopted the cost of healthy diets as one of the indicators to uh, monitor um, national food systems transformation. Because looking at um, the cost of healthy diet in Nigeria um, and comparing that with the cost in other countries, um, it's obvious that our food system is inefficient in, in, in terms of delivering affordable food to people. Um, so it's also informing um, food systems interventions that are being prioritized by the Ministry of Budget and Planning. And one of the priority interventions is uh, Operation Feed Yourself, which is a national home gardening project that is aimed at um, providing information, um, technical assistance, and um, knowledge about where to get the necessary um, tools um, to people so that they can establish home gardens and reduce the costs 
um, of vegetables. You saw it in Anna's presentation, and it's also true for Nigeria, that vegetables are one of the most expensive food group uh, for people to meet recommendations. And so the idea of having home gardens is that when you have the home garden, then you don't have to buy. So that um, brings down the costs and help people to um, consume vegetables every day. Um, the other thing the data is being used for is to identify populations at risk of inadequate dietary intakes and the potential need for social protection. So again, Anna mentioned that, but when you look at the cost of meeting um, the healthy diet and you compare it to minimum wage, or you compare it to the average income among um, different strata of your population, then you can immediately know populations that it will not be possible for them to afford a healthy diet because it's above their um, income. And so you either increase incomes or in the short term, think of social protection programs. Um, the, the World Food Program, so WFP is also using the results for the analysis. They're supporting the government um, to um, develop adequate um, national social protection response based on the information from the cost of healthy diets and um, similar analysis that um, they have done. Um, another thing that is happening in Nigeria is that we are working on a subnational food system dashboard. So what the food system dashboard does is to bring in um, indicators about different aspects of food systems um, into one place. And so there's a national food systems dashboard which um, we learned from and we, we said, oh, we need one that will show this information by states. Um, we are using the cost of healthy diet as an indicator of um, um, the food environment to see how affordable is food in different parts of the country. And there's actually a study that we are working on with Van Geningen University that is looking at the relationship between the food system drivers in different states and the cost of um, healthy diets in the different states. So the next steps for us, now we have this one-time um, snapshot with the 2018 um, survey, but what we, we are hoping to achieve is to start to monitor the cost of healthy diets every um, on a monthly basis. So the National Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria um, collects um, data every month for from over 10,000 markets across the country. Um, they use this data in calculating the consumer price index and other indices every month. And so what we are hoping to do is to, in, in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, um, the Bureau of Statistics and the Food Price for Nutrition team, um, we are working on calculating historical data so from 2016 to 2021, and then we'll be building capacity so that the Bureau of Statistics actually calculates the cost of healthy diets every month as part of the other indices that they calculate using um, price data. And so what we, we hope to do with, with both the historical data and moving forward is to be able to compare um, across the months in a year, the trends in cost of um, healthy diet so that we know we know the seasonal trends and we can predict when the affordability is going to reduce so that um, appropriate food system interventions can be targeted at addressing um, such challenges where they occur. Um, the other thing we, we, we are going to do with the data is that so when we, I, we with identifying seasonal trends, it will serve as early warning to know which periods of the year people are likely to not be able to afford um, a healthy diet and which particular food groups are most affected. Um, the, the, the other thing is that we can compare costs within a state, for instance, to see what are the differences in um, rural urban costs year on year, month on month, to understand how there may be um, inefficiencies in distribution within the same state and then work with the private sector to address such inefficiencies. And then if we compare costs across states in the country, it will help us to see um, the challenges we may have in the supply chain. So if in one place the cost is really very low and in another place is really very high, we can start to look at what can be done to the supply chain um, to reduce the cost in places where um, it is very high.
So the people we expect to use this data, the government is um, a big um, audience for the data. Like I mentioned, this work is being done um, with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. And recently we started collaborations with the um, Ministry of Budget and National Planning that is leading um, the national food systems um, transformation um, work. Um, we expect that with the um, development partners and civil society, we'll also find the data available because it will help them to target interventions and their beneficiaries. Um, so for instance, um, their interventions addressing, targeting, um, improving food security. If we know the particular months when um, the healthy diet may not be, is the least affordable, then those particular months can be um, targeted with interventions rather than just um, maybe picking months randomly or based on other criteria. And it is also a useful advocacy tool um, for the government to um, address um, income, um, wages, and also addressing um, bottlenecks in the food systems. And then we expect that the data will be useful to private sector. Um, those working in the food system to see, oh, there's a business opportunity here because here the price is very high and here it's very low. And so I can leverage on this to, to meet the, um, to, to improve the supply in the places where the cost is very high. And then of course, for the academia, people working in nutrition, um, behavior economics and um, other fields, um, development economics, um, we expect that they will use this data to understand healthy diets, food system challenges, even consumer preferences and how we can leverage on some of these things um, to help people to achieve healthier diets. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Tayo, so much for so much insight about how this project and these data and your interest, your curiosity and your commitment, uh, your energy has really helped to shine kind of a new light on new kinds of questions um, and, and answers that can guide choices. So there's a big agenda ahead and Anna in particular has been leading this effort to think about diet costs with respect to measurement of poverty to guide assistance uh, in addition to the agriculture and food system changes that uh, the Tayo talked about. To do that within countries, as Tayo described, to do it across countries through the international agendas, we have only a few minutes left to sort of tie things together and look forward. So what I wanted to do is just quickly share my screen to have a look at the, um, at the way ahead, the way forward and what we'll be doing in the coming weeks and months that you can follow, that you can participate in. So this is our project website. And the project itself, you can look through, we'll be improving this website, come back to the same address, just Google food prices for nutrition, and you'll see what we do. But in particular, this is a very exciting and busy few weeks and months ahead for us. So in particular, we're having country workshops within individual partners. Uh, such as Tayo's community in Nigeria. We just had one in Ethiopia, earlier had one in Pakistan. But for the global conversations, engagement with the uh, academic societies like the American Society for Nutrition, the American Agricultural Economics Association here. And so if any of you are in associations and groups in your country, in your region, and you would like to have this kind of work be shared, definitely be in touch with Rachel, with Christina, with myself and with Anna in order for us to see how we could help answer any of the questions that your community might have in terms of, for example, the American Society for Nutrition or agricultural and applied economics, uh, but perhaps other kinds of associations too. We of course have this learning lab with the ANH Academy, um, but I especially want to flag the upcoming global launch of the state of what used to be the state of food insecurity in the world, SOFI, and is now state of food security and nutrition, precisely because of the issues that Anna raised where we're speaking of food security in terms of an overall healthy diet. And especially that on July 6th uh, at 10 a.m. in the UN headquarters in New York, 
uh, but for all of us, we'll be joining virtually online. Um, if you look at the UN calendar uh, on July 6th, this event uh, on the 6th of July, you can just watch it at UN television uh, at this address from our website or any other link to this. Um, and what you see is that the SOFI, the state of food and nutrition security in the world, um, now has as its annual theme, repurposing food and agricultural policies to make healthy diets more affordable. So the content of the report, the exact numbers um, that we were able to work with FAO to calculate, and then we're also working with the World Bank, so those data will be available for immediate download for everyone after this date. The, the actual content of the report is confidential until July 6th, but you can see from this site how much they're focusing on cost and affordability of an overall healthy diet. So with that, um, we have six more minutes. Um, Rachel, Christina, Anna, do you want to bring up any specific things from the chat box? Any people you would like to specifically call on who've mentioned things in the chat box or any closing comments? Yeah, we had a lot of really, really great comments. I just wanna say thank you to everyone. We managed to do so much over the course of two hours and um, it, through workshops like these, we also learn a great deal from you. Uh, because we constantly optimize these tools from, from you know, feedback um, in workshops. And it's really great to hear when something isn't working. Uh, so, so when we were jumping into the rooms and you know, reading your comments in the chat and seeing what might have been challenging, it actually helps us uh, create better tools for you and, and your partners in the future. So thank you so much for all the, all the rich feedback. Yeah, and um, in addition, you know, to appreciating everyone's feedback and great comments, and thank you for your participation. Um, one that came up in, in the chat from Suparna uh, was about opportunity costs of procuring food, and Will might want to say a little bit more about that. But that's kind of a new frontier. Um, you know, what we capture in food price data sets is just the face value of buying the food in the market. Um, it does not capture the cost of getting to the market, um, the opportunity cost of, of time to cook particular items or source items from different sources, like growing your own foods or collecting them from the wild, all of which entail time costs and, and opportunity costs. So that's kind of a frontier of research, um, certainly important in food access. And uh, yeah, Will, you might, Want to add something there? Yeah, I think it's a great question. When people are not now eating an overall healthy diet, where is it easiest to get it from? And in many cases, it would be a home garden. In many cases, it would be a villager who is specialized and becomes a source for tomatoes at a particular time, uh, eggs and fruits. You know, people in a village will have mango trees in season, whatever, and then a neighboring village might have something else. So. Clearly these markets are very complicated, but when we look to ask just how much of everything does it cost to make a mango? When you go to the market and you wanna buy one, that cost in Naira in Nigeria is roughly how much it costs to make a mango. Now, of course, getting more mangoes might come from your own house, from your neighbor, from another village, from a different market. But if you ask us, how hard is it to obtain, how difficult is it to obtain a mango? Uh, what you'll see is of course, that's very inexpensive, almost free at some times in some places. Uh, and, and that would be reflected in these costs. There's been interesting things in the chat box specifically about fish and how complicated and challenging it is to think about the least cost fish for nutrients. Uh, great new paper on that that I'll just put in the chat box in a minute. Other closing questions. I think we have big, big improvements already done, already uh, achieved in costing vegetables and fruits, but still lots more improvement there. Uh, and then this question of improving the evidence about uh, affordability of fish is extremely interesting. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add, I thought it was so nice what I uh, Ty said about hearing in this learning lab about this and then following through that please contact us if this is something that you wanna talk more about or you want to do this in your country or so 
so on and so forth. We'd love to engage with you more. Obviously, scaling this up is something that we're really interested in for a small team, but we obviously want to work with as many people as possible, which is why we've put together this toolkit, which we can share with people. We'll help as much as we can, um, and we will improve it as much as we can, so you can all apply it in your own work. Um, but please don't hesitate to reach out. We're really excited to partner with people. Yeah, and I think um, one thing we're proud of, I guess, is time management and being able to make sure that you get a chance to join other events. Um, and just to say thank you for participating in a &H Academy uh, and this, this Learning Lab in particular. Um, you'll find many, many great events coming up, um, including research outcomes you know, from people working with these data. And I hope that next year you can share results from your own work with this kind of data. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to ANH Academy as well for organizing. Yeah, thank you for the support.